Keep News Nation family, thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe. You can also help support this channel by getting yourself some Skiba News Nation merch. Also, we are proud to announce that we are now on Patreon, where you will get bonus content, shoutouts, and much more. Thank you again for watching and helping us stay on the quest for truth. Huge shout out to all our Patreon supporters. Thank you so much for your support. We couldn't do this show without you. If you want to help support us, go to patreon.com forward slash Skiba News Nation. We are also proud to announce that Skiba News Nation podcast is now available on podcast platforms. Welcome to Skiba News Nation, bringing you unfiltered views, news, interviews, discussions, and more. And now, here's your host, Jeremiah Skiba award-winning musician and son of Rob Skiba. Hey Skiba News Nation family, welcome to episode 13 i can't believe it's already been 13 i think this is one of our best ones yet and today we're going to be talking about kid exposes parent indoctrination into the lgbtq plus community shia labeouf converts to catholicism storm seasons on the horizon gorbachev dies mourned in russia u.s life expectancy lowers 20,000 doomsday cult members gather in a cambodian farmhouse an all-new Opus Corner, and for this week's history, we're going to be talking about the suspicious death of Bobby Fuller, and was Norm Macdonald a flat earther? So stay tuned. So before we jump in, I'd like to introduce my co-host, Jake Grant. How you doing, Jake? Hey, Jeremiah. How are you? Doing? I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing all right. I had my catalytic converter stolen. Other than that... Oh, man. Yeah, you got to watch out. People ripping parts out of cars out there, man. Uh, so we're, did we're able to get it fixed, or is it being worked on? It won't be four months until uh, they're able to get the part, the Toyota part. So <laughs> I, I guess wow. I'm just kind of screwed for now. But, yeah, oh, I guess man, they I'm needed it more than that. I do. <laughs> it's all good, man. I can't believe they just ripped it out of your your vehicle there too. That that must have been some desperate car part thievery. <laughs> they don't it's even sell the car anymore. They just take apart. <laughs> yeah, it's all over the DFW area. There there's like a a serial uh, catalytic converter theft, and uh, this is the second time my truck's been broken into in the last six months. So, thanks, Joe Biden. <laughs> Anyways, oh, man. well, you want to jump right in? Yeah, yeah, but we're uh, we got some good news uh, this week. Um, we're gonna cover uh, some interesting topics, and uh, I'm sure we're gonna have a great history segment. So let's do it. Let's do it, man. All right. So this week, we're me and my wife are pretty excited because we're heading to the Bertaria Times National Festival this coming weekend, and uh, we're pretty psyched for that. Uh, they uh, are going to have a bunch of people showing up, and um, for the most part, this is uh, one of the only social media apps that I've really enjoyed using recently. Um, so we're going to go check out this community, and we're going to be selling some fruity fizzy pops <laughs> down at the Bertaria Times. Uh, big first festival that they're putting on here but that's kind of what uh, what made me want to bring up uh, some some interesting interviews that I recently saw tied to Bertaria Times uh, which was Owen Benjamin's interview with uh, Weiss and Triple Crow uh, tri uh, Crow Triple Seven and uh, it's, it's a really great interview breaking down a lot of uh, interesting aspects of the FE topic and questioning the whole uh, the whole realm that we live in, I guess you could just break it down because there's so many aspects of, uh, I, I guess you could say, uh, cosmology and the space programs and the deceptions uh, that surround those that I feel like 
were so important to your father to expose, to keep questioning truth. And it's so awesome to, to see people having interviews like that. So if you guys uh, want to definitely check out that interview because it's one of the more recent ones that uh, David Weiss uh, um, held. He, he's somebody who was also at the Flat Earth Conference circuits. And, um, and I wanted to get into some of this topic because uh, we've had some people recently uh, kind of putting down anybody who questions cosmology as we've been taught in the classrooms or as NASA shovels out to you with their, uh, you know, <laughs> just lies really is what we can call them at um, because a lot of uh, aspects of this topic uh, draw away from the biblical truth of creation. And uh, it's been called a deception. It's been called a distraction. But uh, really, I, I've seen some of the people that are the most aware of deceptions in the world are also the most willing to investigate topics that sound crazy, like FE, mm -hmm. right? And so right. Uh, whenever it comes to this topic, preach the truth, whether it fills up the room or it clears it out, right? <laughs> and, uh, and sometimes conspiratorial topics can scare people away uh, or it can draw people in to hear more right and it all depends on your delivery and unfortunately yep. that that has caused a lot of bad blood with the topic is sometimes people don't have a very couth delivery they're they're either too brash or they're just kind of obnoxious about it um, and uh, the, the problem with that is is it scares people away from important topics right and that's what we never want to do is to scare people away from digging deeper into the truth. And it ties into how the point of modern propaganda isn't only to misinform or to push an agenda, it's to exhaust your critical thinking and to annihilate truth. And so mm -hmm. sometimes people, they just get burnt out. And we can't blame people that mm -hmm. are burnt out for uh, you know, kind of pushing back on a topic, whether the topic is truthful or not. Uh, sometimes when you're overstimulated, as we have seen over the past few years, people get very overstimulated, they can get kind of grumpy. And uh, it's it, it's important to keep an open mind. You know, it's the mark of an intelligent person to be in, to be able to entertain a matter without accepting it. And so that's, that's all that we're talking about here is, you know, you don't have to accept some of our strange beliefs on Skiba News Nation or, or some of our personal opinions, but uh, it, it's important to entertain them for educational value for uh just having a wider world perspective um because i know there's a lot of people who might watch us that don't totally agree with all the things that we might believe in um but mm -hmm. in, in regards to this particular topic that that interview talked about um without all of these lies such as uh the the globe deception regarding how fast we're going through space how fast the earth spins uh the deceptions of the moon landing the cgi pictures that we've received from the space programs uh the the aspect of provable footage showing green screen uh astronaut kind of film where mm -hmm. they have doctored it and presented it as reality um the the topic of uh satellites what are those objects that go across the sky i know i've seen them but um, for a long time, for example, people talked about how satellite phones and, and satellite internet were how <laughs> you got, did you know a lot of that's land based? Like 99% of all cell phone and internet activity is based on, uh, on the land and through cell towers. And, um, you know, not only that, but the whole topic of gravity, uh, gravity still being a theory, but it's used to explain 90% of what we can observe in the in the known universe according to modern scientism scientists, right? Um, but yet they'll use big terms like dark matter, dark energy to explain all the missing matter that would be required for what we can observe to make sense. And so it's all these conjecture uh, equations that are then being shoved down our throats as how we should view and believe in reality but when it comes to what this realm is we know that the scriptures the the bible contradicts the the big bang theory and the modern version of evolution that took billions and billions of years from a sea goop of 
uh, little you know anemones that gathered together and became creatures uh, we know these are direct contradictions to the word of the most high and and there might be people listening that are not believers in the bible but the reason we find empirical evidence for uh, the scripture and the creationist model to become true is uh, that there are forms of of microevolution within kinds of animals. There are changes within kinds, but there's no observable evidence of macroevolution, which is a change between species. Uh, we see that um, there's a lot of uh, proofs for the creationist model, such as uh, the worldwide flood that explain that that proves through sediment layers that there was a cataclysmic event that complete that created these uh, rock sediment layers. Uh, in a very quick amount of time, but these same sediment layers are then used to prove millions and millions of years of time span. But then you find fossils and the bones of creatures uh, encased cross, uh, you know, in, in multiple layers, showing that it was actually more of a, a sediment settling uh, during uh, the worldwide mm -hmm. flood as described in, in the Bible. Um, and, and talking about dinosaurs and such, uh, we have proof that mankind walked beside these creatures that science would tell us is millions of years old, the bones and the remains of these dinosaurs. And yet we find in the, like in the Paloxi River, uh, footprints side by side uh, with dinosaurs um, of mankind and dinosaur. Um, and also in, in the ancient record, we have many ancient cultures in their depictions on uh, on their wall with artwork of them living side by side with dinosaurs. And so all of these start to make people, you know, what the scientism pushes, make people question a creator, make people question uh, the biblical narrative. But what we found uh, through questioning and challenging the deceptions that come from agencies like NASA, space agencies, governments, uh, is that there's more to be questioned than we might have first believed and all of these questions consistently for people that dive down that rabbit hole generally lead them to a belief in the creator to an investigation of the biblical texts to a, an investigation of the the realm that we live in like do we do we have to buy all of the uh, assumptive math that scientism pushes on us or um can we accept merely uh experimentation that we've observed ourselves we've done and and wait for the burden of proof of uh, of a lot of the conjecture that's been taught as full-blown science to be proven and and so that's what has led a lot of people like uh your dad um rob and and owen benjamin and uh david weiss and crow triple seven mm. these guys uh have found to investigate this topic has opened up the world to a whole new realm of possibilities and and so that's why i, I wanted to share that uh the interview here um for people to check out sometime because i know recently you've had a lot of people questioning this topic uh you gotta throw this in here nasa is just satan minus the t and that's why they say t minus when they blast off <laughs> <laughs> oh man i, I know they uh they of course are referring to T minus or time minus whatever, but it, whenever you look at who founded uh, NASA, you mm -hmm. ought to realize that guys like Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard, um, all these figures traditionally have ties to uh, very very satanic beliefs and practices, and these are the people that founded the the space programs, the rocket programs, and. It's just very interesting uh, who was in charge of these programs and and that this is now the programs we have to put so much blind trust and faith in. Now, I would rather have questions that can't be answered than answers that can't be questioned. And this doesn't just end with the the controversial topic of scientism and, and science falsely so-called, but also in the medical industry and, and things like mm -hmm. that where... Uh, people push solutions that can't be questioned and that that completely takes away uh the rational thinking mind which can pick apart 
discrepancies in the narrative, right? And they, they'd rather you don't question them at all. And that's why we're dealing with so much censorship. But uh, this is tied to uh, even historical things. Like so many people praise Albert Einstein, E, e equals MC squared, right? And did you know that in 1931, a hundred prestigious Austrian and German scientists contributed to a book entitled Hundert Autoren gegen Einstein? in which they denounced Albert Einstein and accused him of leading science into the realm of pseudo-mysticism, abstraction, and speculation. Hmm. And now we can see why so many people uh, in modern science uplift and esteem Albert Einstein, because a lot of modern scientific theory, whether we're talking about multiverse possibilities or, or uh, uh, just there's so many equation-based sciences that are based on abstraction and speculation and so they're kind of piggybacking off of the rock star scientist albert right and mm -hmm. uh, i find it funny that you know how albert einstein you're gonna get a kick out of this jeremiah albert einstein's famous relativity equation e equals mc squared right mm -hmm. yeah well uh did you know that uh there's an alternate meaning to e equals mc squared which is uh einstein which is Albert's last name, last name, marries two cousins, squared, right? <laughs> and uh, a lot of people don't know that Al uh, Albert Einstein was a, uh, a, a rebel to the traditional values of not marrying your cousin, <laughs> so much so that he did it twice. He married two of his cousins, uh, and, you know, just what a mess of a person, but Anyways, he's got that funny picture where he's sticking his tongue out, right? Uh, yeah. Albert Einstein. Oh, man. Um, and, and so whenever we talk about uh, scientism and uh, a lot of the beliefs and deceptions that are being pushed on the world, uh, here's a great example. Being too close to the wrong people can ruin you. You know, it's, it's yep. bad company corrupts good, good morals, right? That's a, a, even a biblical concept. And it's sad because um, the crowds we run in, we tend to buy the lies that they buy because we want to fit in. We want to conform. And when everybody around you is reinforcing the deceptions, uh, it, it can be kind of uh, like a nightmare to, to try to share truths or share an alternative perspective. I mean, imagine what people over the past two years dealing with this current medical industry trying to warn their family had to deal with when people just shut their ears and would just uh you know it's 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 really uh something that uh, this generation of truthers is having to learn more and more is mm -hmm. that um the more you are part of the system the more you're sometimes beholden to the system and that's why we're supposed to come out of Babylon, right? Leave Babylon so we don't partake in the plagues and judgments because of that same reason is, you know, being too close to the wrong people can ruin you. Mm -hmm. And that's a that's a scriptural warning, you know, come out of Babylon. But, uh, you know, don't forget what they did in the name of science, right? Don't forget what our system pushed <laughs> on people, uh, man, because they they definitely wanted you to buy the lie without questioning it. Yep. Um, and so what we need to encourage people to do and what Skiba News Nation I feel like wants to encourage people to be is to be like Toto right? Mm -hmm. Toto and the Wizard of Oz pulled back the veil to uncover the lies and deception so guys be like Toto right? That's a, <laughs> that's a motto you could be uh, you could put on a shirt yeah alright so um Opa, I sent you a video, and it's a funny video of a, a kid who snitches on his mother for pushing the LGBTQ agenda on their live streams. I guess they're, they're streamers, and uh, it's hilarious how this kid just goes straight full honesty. So, Opa, if you'd show that video I sent you. People that aren't, like, serial killers like Ted Bundy. Does your mom say you have to be LGBT? Um, no. no! I can choose what I want to be, but some... T but... Go ahead, Lex. Go ahead. Keep talking. Say what you're saying. Um, 
my mom doesn't matter if I'm up if I am gay or lesbian or any of that. She doesn't care. All she cares about is that I'm a part of it. And if I'm not a part of it, she'll try to convince me to uh, um, get, join it. Cause I. What are you saying right now? <laughs> Facts. That I would convince you to join what? Facts. The LGBTQIA plus community. White people that aren't like serial killers wow. like that. Does your mom say That's you have problem. to be? All right. That's great. Yeah. So <laughs> you can hear it from from his mouth. He was like, "Facts, mom." Facts. Facts. Even though you're not gonna, f <laughs> you won't force me. You're gonna want me to be part of it because that's what you want to be. Is you want to be part of these movements? It, there's there's a almost like a a shiny badge of honor that people get for saying, "Oh, I support this minority group," or "I support this activist uh, ideology," or or whatever. And unfortunately, um, it's just like crazy. And and it I caught this interesting <laughs> thing. It says, "If you don't support drag queens teaching sex ed to first graders." You're a Nazi, Nazu, and me dressing up as this that they <laughs> apparently claim that we are, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it's crazy just the agendas that are being pushed on next generation, and uh, we got we just gotta stand up for our beliefs and call it out for what it is. Is unfortunately the the LGBTQ plus community is uh, uh, has groomer. Mm -hmm. Uh, qualities to it yep. because when you're pushing it on young children you are kind of grooming the next crop of your terminology you know coined whatever well they and, feel like it's uh, the new hip thing they feel like it's the new hip thing it's whatever is hip yes. is what kids are going to like you know and so if they're pushing all this stuff it's going to make a kid be like oh that's cool I want to do that but it's not you know what I mean not to mention the attention you get like yes it, it used to be a shame thing back in the day the whole being in the closet was all about you, you don't want to come out and reveal your the sin in your closet <laughs> because then you feel shame but now it's almost a, re a role reversal where uh where the sin in the closet's now paraded as an identity it's paraded as a, a something exciting and something that should be publicized everywhere and it's not that we're harping on one sin more than the other right it's 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 just that whenever sin is paraded as something that's right and something that's an identity then it's something that needs to be addressed publicly um, because we're not justifying any other sins but what we are is calling out people that are convincing children that a sinful lifestyle, which is no worse, by the way, than a guy, you know, like whoring around or whatever, right? Or, mm -hmm. or somebody who's, you know, uh, you know, uh, it just, there's, it's, it's just that whenever somebody comes after the children is when people have to stand up against it. And so, um, absolutely moving on to our next topic, uh, we have, a something interesting uh if you're familiar with uh shia labeouf <laughs> uh famous actor transformer actor uh found it very interesting that recently uh he in performing for a part uh as a italian monk padre pio in a film that's coming out that because of his time uh he he thinks that uh what of his experience in the celebration of the mass um he recently cited the traditional Latin mass as motivation for his conversion to Catholicism. So very interesting. Shia LaBeouf converting to a form of, uh, Catholicism. Um, and uh, you know, I know Shia LaBeouf's gone through a lot of, uh, ups and downs with his careers. Um, kind of interesting that he, he's chose Catholicism to convert, uh, and, uh, I would just encourage him. I know man that you had some rough times, Looks like you're really seeking for some spiritual guidance. I, I've seen a lot of interviews with them talking about uh, him joining AA and uh, how even through that he was seeking kind of a higher power to lead him because he was in a rough spot. Uh, I would just encourage you, man, don't stop just there at the Catholic Church. Keep digging <laughs> deeper because uh, you'll find that the Catholic Church uh, has a lot of uh, man Dark stuff. And... Uh, and a lot of uh, uh, dark stuff tied to it. And so it's a great thing that you're trying to reform, Shy, 
uh, but don't stop just at the surface level biggest you know universal church as the Catholics claim to be but keep pursuing deeper because uh, the true believers of, of the scripture and God look very different than what man's traditions have tacked on to it over a long period of time for example read uh, Exodus 20 and you'll you'll recognize that Sunday is not Shabbat right for example one of the the traditions that have superseded the very commands of God uh, here's a from the Catholic Cardinal Gibbons uh, from Faith of Our Fathers you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday the scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday Shabbat a day which we never sanctify this is big commandment number four and you'll recognize uh, if you study a little bit and you don't just take the word of your priest that there have been many traditions of men that have been added to the faith of our fathers uh, and the faith of those who are in the scripture right and, and he cited in a recent interview I saw of how uh, he read the Gospels and 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 he had never re read the Gospels before he had always had a preconceived notion of Christ and uh, and so just to let you know man watch out because it used to be Satan who convinced everyone not to keep the commandments now it's Christians mm -hmm. <laughs> through you know country club Christianity uh, through traditions through the the elders in the Catholic Church through uh, you know honoring the Saints that then tell you you can do contrary to what God commands that's the the catch that modern religiosity modern religion uh, has got people stuck in is in these cycles of lawlessness right um, not to mention you know the organization you're signing up with uh, here's a funny meme I think we came to the wrong predator convention <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you ever seen the predator movies man uh, but uh, yeah definitely the wrong predator convention you know this is something yep. that's not only in the Catholic Church but also in the Protestant Church uh, many allegations of abuse cover up uh you know it's it's not that once you join a religion these are sinless people uh but you got to qu question and listen very intently and closely regarding what they say regarding sin because if they say obey god keep his commandments uh you're probably closer to the truth than those who justify doing away with them uh, even the least jot or tittle is what matthew 5 17 through 19 says so if shy ends up listening to this Hey man, keep digging. Uh, don't stop just at the surface level church. Whether it's Catholic, Protestant, uh, seek into the Word of God, and that's where you'll learn what He wants from us, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I hear they're going to create hundreds of laws this year. Uh, and then uh, over here, uh, until we learn to follow the 10 God gave us, nothing will ever change. And uh, it's funny that in society, government creates millions of laws over its course of time hundreds of thousands of laws that people will never know about until they break them you know and they get caught mm -hmm. in the system but uh, until people seek after learning what the laws of the most high are uh, our society is going to just continue to degrade and once again big government is for a lawless generation but those who obey the laws of a creator need less government because they're not murdering and stealing and taking everybody's wives and uh, all right so um, coming up, uh, tax cheats are apparently costing the U.S. $1 trillion a year, the IRS estimates. And, uh, and we've covered in the last few weeks the army of tax collectors that have just been hired by the IRS. And uh, this is from the Los Angeles Times uh, posting that this is the big number that they're coming after, guys, a trillion dollars a year that they're looking to squeeze out of people that fudge the numbers a little bit in their taxes. So uh, keep that on your radar. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, here's an interesting picture from a Starbucks. Uh, it says, from October 1st, 2022, we will only be accepting card, contactless, and Starbucks reward payments. Please ask Whoa. our team for further details, right? So that's pretty interesting that we're very quickly heading towards a cashless society. Now, of course, uh, people are, are afraid possibly uh, from contamination on physical money. And yeah. with all the, the big medical scares over the past few years, it makes sense that this was the next logical conclusion. But 
it really does lend credence to the whole uh, topic of a one world currency, a, di- a digital currency, a, a mm-hmm. federal gov- government backed uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, but just want to show you guys this picture because it, it, it ties into some uh, Bible prophecy because with cashless transactions very easily you can be shut out of that system unless you obey the precepts of that system so something to be aware of uh now recently heard uh, some funny stuff of texas uh shipping up uh migrants from uh uh people coming into their state uh up to states that have very pro uh well they're the liberal, sanctuary cities uh, they're worshiping them to the yes. sanctuary cities that are like, oh, you guys can come here. It's okay to cross the border. And then once they get there, they're like, no. <laughs> That's Texas for you. Don't mess with Texas. Yeah, exactly. Like, um, <laughs> it's not that we're against people migrating to the U.S., but done lawfully done legally that's that's always should be the answer because as many um, generations have you know, in it, the past many generations have yeah, used to have exactly. to do it legally and now it's just a free-for-all which is kind of unfair to the people that that have come over to this country legally and these people just come across the border and that's okay you get your citizenship and everything i mean there used to be a process to it and we don't know who's coming in it could be killers you know there was a guy actually that was uh, convicted twice, sent back uh, of murder, and then came back over the border and back into the United States. Do you know about that guy? Oh man, that's yeah, it's crazy that that can happen. Um, and uh, it's it's almost like the democratic policy is very welcoming to people who want to become a burden on the system and not enter legally and. Yeah, I have a lot of friends uh, who uh, grew up overseas and they went through a very drawn out process to become legal uh, residents, legal citizens uh, Mm -hmm. from growing up overseas. I've known many people over the years. And so um, to see that this current administration is pushing so heavily for open borders, uh, it makes me laugh that (laughs) that people are shipping the, the people that are being let in up to these sanctuary cities and now this this article saying sources confirm new york city is now using 14 hotels to house migrants and um buckle up plaza hotel and fluff out those king beds carlisle it's going to take a lot of more hotels classrooms and social services to hold all the migrants coming new york's way so um one of the other big reasons possibly to not live in these big cities or these uh the cities with such stringent liberal policies uh, because it's going to affect the life uh, quality of those who live in close proximity to people being brought in shipped in like this and uh, not to mention uh, the danger of having unregistered uh, illegal immigrants just being bussed in by the truckload right so Mm -hmm. um Moves on to uh, some other interesting news here, guys. We have um, another warning for just blindly jumping into uh, faith-based systems, religions without, you know, maybe further investigation, maybe reading the book on your own. Uh, What a crazy suggestion, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it says here, 20,000 doomsday cult members are gathering at a Cambodian farmhouse to see out the end of the world after their leader predicts biblical flood that will engulf the planet but not his property (laughs) um so very interesting uh he's urging cambodians to move back home and get ready for a world disaster um you know the uh the scriptures talk about how there will be many false prophets and many people who come in christ's name even and say he is the christ but they will lead many people astray so, um, you know, we're just seeing more more false prophets rising up in the world today. Now, uh, in more like a practical news, uh, the storm of the season threatens U.S. coast. The tropical storm forming in the Atlantic has an 80 percent chance of turning into a hurricane by Labor Day after the Sahara dust suppressed severe weather over the Atlantic. Uh, so uh, there's two weather systems over the Atlantic and they're developing into possibly a a pretty strong storm down south um 
So it's called Typhoon Hinamnor, Hin Hinamnor, <laughs> and it reaches super typhoon strength and becomes the strongest tropical cyclone of the year. And um, the system is currently located well east of Okinawa, Japan, and is headed west at 28 kilometers per hour. Uh, so it's very interesting. These storm systems that are uh, boiling up all across the world. We're entering into uh, weather, bad weather season. Uh, here's mm -hmm. another U.S. braces for a battering by three potential hurricanes in September, including one that could spoil Labor Day for millions after boiling August, which saw no named storms for only the third time in 60 years. That's really interesting that all of August there were no big storms in over in the first time in over 60 years. Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, anyways, just wanted to cover this, uh, for people who maybe live down in those areas that could be affected by flooding. Uh, I know there was recently dramatic rainfall in areas like downtown Dallas that yep. you experienced, uh, Jeremiah. Yeah, it was pretty close. It was in the, it was which way from us? South. south. It was south from us, barely, so so glad that we didn't get all that craziness that we saw in the news i'm very blessed yeah i'm glad you guys are okay um we have another uh breaking news gorbachev uh mourned as a rare world leader but still some bitter now what's this about well gorbachev this guy right here with the birthmark on his head uh he's a very old school russian leader one of the last leaders of the soviet union before it disbanded uh, he died this Tuesday. Mm. Um, so uh, the last leader of the Soviet Union, and for many men, the one who restored democracy to the then communist-ruled European nations, was saluted Wednesday as a rare leader who changed the world for a time and brought hope to peace among superpowers. But the man who died Tuesday at 91 was also reviled by many countrymen who blamed him for the 1991 implosion of the Soviet Union and its diminution of as a superpower. The Russian nation that emerged from its Soviet past shrank in size as 15 new nations were created. Uh, so this is leading into possibly the same topic that we've been covering over the past few weeks of the uh, Soviet incursion into Ukraine, uh, the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine, uh, which was one of those places uh, that was considered part of the old Soviet Union. A uh, loss of pride and power also eventually led to the rise in Russian President Vladimir Putin, who has tried for the past quarter century to restore Russia to its former glory and beyond. So, uh, interesting world figure that just recently passed away. Um, hopefully his demise doesn't signal, uh, you know, a prophetic move of the Soviet restoration of, you know, their previous borders, but it makes sense that um, you know, Putin is pushing to reestablish the the size and the honor that the Soviet Union once possessed before it shrank as 15 new nations were created out from it uh, during the 1991 implosion. All right, guys. So uh, here's an interesting thing. U.S. life expectancy falls again in a historic setback. The decline during the pandemic is sharp sharpest in nearly 100 years hitting American Indian and native Alaskan communities particularly hard so apparently just recently they measured that the average life expectancy of Americans uh, fell precipitously in 2020 and 2021 um, and um, the figure uh, dropped uh, so could Americans could expect to live until the age of 76 the figure represents a loss of almost three years since 2019 when Americans could expect to live on average 79 years. Uh, it's kind of interesting to me just the um, the impact of these numbers and the past two years. Uh, now, I'm not going to read this out loud, but um, looks like the FDA is authorizing another push for medical experiments. Oh. Uh, and I am of the opinion that this will uh, decrease that life expectancy number even uh, more dramatically yep. as we're reading through. So uh, I believe personally that there's a direct correlation between uh, the experimentation that's been 
passed out as mandates over the past two or two years or so. And the more people that buy into that um, agenda, uh, their life expectancy is going to go down. So um, I know that can be alarming to some, but uh, we're going to leave it very vague like that because we can get shut down and censored off the Internet. Um, so anyways, uh, Jeremiah, that's all of the news articles I have for us today. Um, hopefully covered a wide range for people and, uh, you know, something to discuss. Are, 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 the, are there any that stood out to you as significant or... Or anything you would like to, you know. I mean, down? I think the Shia LaBeouf thing is pretty crazy. I, I it's kind of uh, he takes method acting a little too seriously. I think like every role that he's ever done, he's like become. You know what I mean? Every single one. And then you know, uh, in 2016, when Trump became president, he he had that campaign. He will not divide us. He will not divide us. Do you remember that? And the flag. Uh, yeah, I do. Yeah, that was a funny. Uh, Thing. but yeah that's crazy stuff man well i appreciate it that yeah, was no great problem. current news man so uh i'm happy to announce that we have an all-new opus corner so opa take it away my hut, der hat drei ecken. Drei ecken hat mein hut. Und hat er nicht drei ecken. Das ist es nicht mein hut. Welcome to this week's episode of Opa's Corner. So, we start off with a story. A man walks into a restaurant with a full-grown ostrich behind him. The waitress asks for their orders. The guy says, uh, hamburger, fries, and a Coke, and turns to the ostrich. What's yours? I'll have the same, says the ostrich. A short time later, the waitress returns with the order. That will be $18.40, please. The man reaches into his pocket and without looking, pulls out the exact change for payment. The next day, the guy and the ostrich return to the same restaurant. And the guy says, a hamburger, fries, and a Coke. The ostrich says, I'll have the same. Again. The guy reaches into his pocket and pays with exact change. This becomes routine until one night they enter the restaurant and the waitress asks, The usual? Uh, no, this is Friday night. So I'll have uh, a steak, baked potato, and a salad, says the guy. Me too, says the ostrich. The waitress brings the order and says, that will be $42.62. Once again, the guy pulls the exact change out of his pocket and places it on the table. The waitress can't hold back her curiosity any longer. Excuse me, sir. How do you manage to always come up with the exact change out of your pocket every time? Well, says the guy, Several years ago, I was cleaning my attic, and I found an old lamp. When I rubbed it, a genie appeared and offered me two wishes. My first wish was that if I ever had to pay for anything, I would just put my hand in my pocket and the right amount of money would always be there. That's brilliant, says the waitress. Most people would wish for a million dollars or something. But you'll always be as rich as you want for as long as you live. That's right. Whether it's a gallon of milk or a Rolls Royce, the exact money is always there, says the guy. The waitress asks, but sir, what's with the ostrich? The guy sighs and answers, well, my second wish was for a tall chick with long legs who agrees with everything I say. <laughs> Late one night, this guy is speeding down an empty road. A cop sees him go flying past, so chases after him and pulls him over. The cop goes up to the car, and when the man rolls down the window, he asks, are you aware of how fast you were going, sir? 
The man replies, Yes, I am. I'm trying to escape a robbery I got involved in. The cop looks at him disbelievingly and asks him, You were the one being robbed, sir? The man casually replies, Oh, no. I was the one who committed the robbery. I was escaping. The cop is shocked and surprised that the man has admitted this so freely. He says, So you're telling me you were speeding and committed a robbery? Oh, yeah, replied the man calmly. And I have all the loot in the back. The cop is now starting to get angry and says, Sir, I'm afraid you'll have to come with me as he reaches into the window to take the car keys out of the ignition. The man shouts, Don't do that! I'm afraid you'll find the gun in my glove compartment. At this, the cop pulls his hand out of the window and says, Wait here, as he returns to his car to call for backup. Soon, there are police cars and helicopters all over, everywhere you look. The man is quickly dragged out of his car, handcuffed, and taken toward the police car. However, before he's put in the car and taken away, a police sergeant walks up to him and says, while pointing at the cop that pulled him over, Sir, this officer tells us that you had committed a robbery, had stolen loot in the trunk, and had a loaded gun in your glove compartment. However, we didn't find any of these things in your car. The man replies, Yeah, and I bet that liar said I was speeding, too. <laughs> and now, for the funnies. Here are a few funnies for the start of a new school year. My homework is stuck on a boat because of international supply chain related port delays. Homework due today. No excuses. <laughs> Look silly, but the kids are finally listening to her. History class is hard to understand. We're still in the pre-iPhone period. <laughs> it's I before flee, except after C. Oh, look, this get better. F in history. You even flunk something not happened yet. <laughs> Charles Dickens finally breaks through his writer's block. Uh, I can't think of another story, Sam. Give me a martini. Oliver Twist. After 39 years and 11 months of stubbornly wandering the desert, Moses' wife decides to ask for directions to the Promised Land. In God's Kitchen. Something tells me this thing's only half-baked. Amish Road Rage. Get thee out of the way! Go raise a barn! Thy mother wears army bonnets! Step on it, yonder! Place it up thy butter churn! Disaster befalls Professor Schnabel's cleaning lady when she mistakes his time machine for a new dryer. And down they went, Bob and Francine, two more victims of the La Brea carpets. Prince Charming and Cinderella, the later years. Those better not be my glass slippers you're wearing to take out the garbage! Alexa, play me a little Tom Petty. Alexa's in the living room. You're talking to the tuna fish can. 
Bachelor number three, who would you rather swallow? Mickey Mouse, Speedy Gonzalez, or Rocky the Flying Squirrel? And why? <laughs> Superman in his later years. Dang. Now where was I going? Look, you had five bones, right? Your friend Zuki comes over and stays a while, then leaves. Now you have four bones, right? You don't have to be a lassie to figure that one out. On October 23rd, 1927, three days after its invention, the first rubber band is tested. <laughs> oh man! Look, Ernie! This guy has the winning lottery ticket in his pocket! Lucky stiff. <laughs> After 50 years as the church organist, Gladys made a genuine effort to adjust to the new worship format. You've got the whole plane to yourself. The large group going to the psychic convention all canceled at the last moment. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I give you the world's greatest escape artist, the Great Waldo! You must be new here. That's Miss Crutchfield. She's here to make sure nobody runs with scissors. Oh, great. Here comes my boss. That big dumb geek. I hate him so. Oh yeah? Lewis, you're fired. You apparently forgot. This is a cartoon, and I can read every word you think. <laughs> and finally, here is Germany's entry for the upcoming Iditarod. And this concludes another episode of Opa's Corner. Funny as always, Opa. Thank you for another great Opa's Corner. Yeah. For all you fans of Opa out there, we now have a YouTube channel that's all for Opa's Corner. So if you want to watch it whenever, or just his Opa's Corner clips, you can go to the, the channel. It's in the description below. Sweet, man. Well, let's get into some history. I got some pretty interesting stuff. So this week's history is going to be revolving around musicians. This week's history is about Bobby Fuller. A lot of you may not know who Bobby Fuller was. He was an American rock star best known for his hit song, I Fought the Law, who suspiciously died July 18, 1966 at the age of 23. Within months of becoming a top 10 recording artist, Fuller was found dead in his car parked outside of his Hollywood apartment. Bobby's face, chest, and sides were covered in bruises, and there was a can of gasoline found inside of his car, and police refused to investigate. But just like the other musicians we've talked about, authorities quickly ruled his death a suicide or accidental, just like, you know, Kurt Cobain. So in this episode, I'm going to show you the darkness and the evilness of the music industry and how it contributed to the death, murder of Bobby Fuller. That's me, Bobby Fuller. In the early 1960s, this handsome, wholesome singer-songwriter was quickly climbing up the rock and roll ranks. His hit song, I Fought the Law, earned Fuller instant fame and top billing at LA's hottest night spots. He had everything to live for. What happened? I don't know. We'll dissect the many theories of how and why this tragedy took place. He had sc scratch marks and scrapes on his arms, like he had been dragged on asphalt or gravel. And we'll try to figure out who wanted Fuller dead. Was there a connection to the underworld? The mob saw his potential success and wanted in on it. And for the first time in decades, a mystery woman breaks her silence about the deadly events of that night. His mom had called me 
and said that she thought he was walking downstairs to meet me. On a hot summer evening in 1966, the battered corpse of 23-year-old rock and roll star Bobby Fuller was discovered by his mother outside the family's Hollywood apartment. Bobby's brother, Randy Fuller, recalls the gruesome scene. A lot of people say he slumped over the steering wheel, but I don't, I don't remember that. All I remember, he was down in the seat, and I could see that part of his eyebrow was torn. And then there was a puddle of blood under his face. Bobby's bizarre death came as a shock to his family and friends. Among the mourners was Bob Keane, the president of Delphi Records, where Bobby Fuller recorded his greatest hit. He was a young, very talented young man from a little town in, in America. And he came up to the big city, and it killed him, because I believe he was naive. Well, growing up in El Paso was uh, kind of boring. In 1959, 17-year-old Bobby graduated from high school and decided to pursue a career in music. Then in 1962, 20-year-old Bobby formed his own band. He was the only sort of rock star to ever come out of El Paso, really. When he left and went to Los Angeles, people in El Paso sort of had high expectations. In the summer of 1963, Bobby's popularity rose when he blended his West Texas rock with the West Coast craze, surf music. But that sound was soon replaced due to something called the British Invasion. That was in the 60s, and uh, the Beatles had just come in, and uh, it was... Uh, the beginning of a whole new thing musically. Uh, Bobby was right on the edge of it. His, he had a new sound, and his band was uh, so incredible when he was playing live. I mean, he was just so driving, so much, so much energy. That stage presence paid off for 22-year-old Bobby. In 1964, Bobby and his band were offered a recording contract with Delphi Records. The Bobby Fuller Four recorded the 1965 release of Bobby's chart topper, I Fought the Law. Journalist Dan Epstein. I thought the law went straight into the top ten. All of a sudden, Bobby Fuller Four were, were a national name. In the 1960s, renowned radio and television fixture Casey Kasem hosted a teen dance show for local television called Shebang. I hired Bobby Fuller Four, and that was the best thing I'd ever done, because this four-piece band had those people on their feet dancing. The hip L.A. club scene enticed the innocent rock and roller. There were also a lot of rumors that Bobby had been frequenting nightclubs with a lot of unsavory characters, mob-connected people, prostitutes, drug dealers, as well as movie stars, this sort of thing. He was kind of hungry for, for the experience of Hollywood. But what's crystal clear is that on July 18, 1966, 23-year-old Bobby paid the ultimate price for his loss of innocence. You see, he got a phone call in the morning, and he said, Mom, I'll be back. I won't be going too long. He took off. Then Bobby left the building shortly thereafter. Witnesses have said that they saw a white car driving up and down the street kind of quickly around 4 in the morning. Around 5 o'clock that evening, Bobby's worried mother, Lorraine, noticed that her car mysteriously reappeared. And she walked over to it and opened the door and was just hit by the stench of gasoline. The cop came up, made some remark about another rock and roller ODing and... It was obvious suicide. Delphi Records president Bob Keane disagrees. A cop came up, opened the door, and there was an empty can of gas there, a big can, he took that and threw it in the dumpster. At that point, I said, uh, hey, that's evidence. How do we know that uh, he wasn't killed or murdered or something like that? For some reason, the cops decided it was an open and shut case. And I said, how's your investigation going? And they said, well, you know, it's suicide. And I said, no, it wasn't. He was on the verge of major success but I would never believe that he took his own life. This was not a man who just suddenly decided my life is not worth living. I'm gonna go and kill myself. He didn't have a suicidal bone in his body. He was telling me how much he was looking forward to the future. He had bruises on his body and that he had scratch marks and scrapes on his arms, like he had been dragged on asphalt or gravel. That day, rather, before, before he died, he told me that they were gonna to go to a party that night and take LSD with a lot of high-class people. Bobby was a very high-strung young man, and I doubt whether he could handle the LSD. It's very possible that he had a bad trip, uh, somehow or other fell off a cliff, or who knows what happened. There's only one problem with this explanation. 
The medical examiner found no traces of mind-altering substances in his bloodstream. The party didn't actually happen. Bobby was still at his apartment building at about 3, 3 o'clock in the morning on the 18th and still in his just hanging around the house clothes. He hadn't gotten dressed up to go out anywhere. He's been linked with a woman by the name of Melody, who some say was his girlfriend, some say was just a friend, and, uh, and many think had something to do with his uh, eventual demise. I was like the go-between to talk to Bobby and see what was on his mind, what bothered him and stuff like that. The mob was, was certainly present in the music industry. There are rumors that Melody was the girlfriend of a prominent mob figure and club owner. Melody became the cop's only lead in the brief investigation of Bobby's death. But all they were interested in were, were drugs. And I started to get angry with him, and I kept saying, he was not a suicide, why don't you find out? But the police never did find out what happened. Instead, a slew of questions remain unanswered. Now you know a brief history, but you kind of got the basics yeah, of it. Yeah, it's uh, definitely one of those really interesting cases of uh, the cops opening and closing a possible suicide slash murder. And, uh, you know, just like we talked about in the last uh, two discussions about, like, Kurt and, and Jimmy, uh, it, it's interesting, like, this person who was rising up, becoming more influential... Uh, was yep. taken out so early, right? Uh, and I find it interesting how y you you knew that his uh, somebody he looked up to was Buddy Holly, who mm -hmm. was another figure who had an untimely death and was gaining a lot of traction in the music industry. Like all these, you know, climbing rising stars, right? Being, you know, chopped out uh, far too soon. Absolutely. In the second clip, I'm going to show you that the length of people's lives are significantly shorter if you're like a famous musician. And that's what I'm going to show in this next clip. And uh, it does talk about Jimi Hendrix and all the other cases that we've talked about. And let's go ahead and play that one. The Jimi Hendrix experience is over. The acid rock musician died today in a London hospital, apparently from an overdose of drugs. The death of another rock musician was disclosed today. Jim Morrison, 27 years old, lead singer of The Doors. His manager said Morrison died six days ago in Paris, either of a heart attack or pneumonia. But the death was kept secret to avoid a sensation. Kurt Cobain, the lead singer of the enormously popular rock band Nirvana, is dead at the age of 27. More now from NBC's Brian Williams. Hollywood coroner says an overdose of narcotics is responsible for the death of the well-known rock singer Janis Joplin. Miss Joplin was found dead in her bedroom last night. Exactly what happened inside the iconic Beverly Hilton remains a mystery. Paramedics raced to the fourth floor and found a lifeless Whitney Houston inside her hotel room bathtub. Both the Los Angeles Times and CBS News are both now reporting that Michael Jackson has died. I don't think many people at first glance would regard being a popular musician to be particularly deadly, but looking at the data, we see something rather peculiar. According to a study conducted by the University of Sydney, which sampled 13,000 different artists across seven decades, it was noted that a popular musician's life expectancy was up to 25 years shorter comparable to the general population. Furthermore, accidental death rates were between five and 10 times greater, suicide rates were between two and seven times greater, and homicide rates were up to eight times greater. The study suggests an average life expectancy for musicians that are male to be in the late 50s and women in the early 60s. At first glance, these numbers are hard to contextualize, so let me give you something to compare it to. This is the same life expectancy you'd expect to see for a police officer in Buffalo, which has been labeled the most dangerous city in New York. Or if we're talking about the 90s, a male musician has a shorter life expectancy than a coal miner in China in the 1980s. These numbers make it clear as day that the true price of fame in the music industry is up to 25 years off your life. But that's not to say that fame is this deadly across the board. In another study that sampled a thousand different notable people from 2009 to 2011 from all professions, they found that those notable for their work in business, politics, or military generally lived longer than the national average. While writers, performers, and other creative types were only noted to have their lives shortened by a year. So what is going on with the music industry in particular? 
While we've established that the music industry is particularly deadly, the vast majority of the literature on the phenomena seems to isolate this to just one or two things, such as the added stresses from fame or the ease of access to substance, or that creative types tend to be more predisposed to mental illness. While there's no denying that these factors definitely play a role in this phenomena, perhaps there's a bit more to this story. While much of the formal research on this topic scrutinizes what is wrong with the artist as an individual, perhaps it's better in this case to focus on what is going on within the industry as a whole. Because if you shift focus away from the individual to the industry, and you pause for a moment to think about the financial incentives of the music world, you'll notice something incredibly concerning. Music is one of the few industries on the planet where someone's work is worth significantly more to a company after their passing. Generations are remembered by the art that they leave behind, and the easiest way to be remembered is to be hailed as a legend from that time period. A premature death can take an artist from a good artist to a legend, which can in some cases solidify an artist's recording catalog to be a cash cow for decades to come. Think about this for a moment. When an artist signs his name on the dotted line to a record company, the record company will in many cases own all of the masters for the songs recorded under that contract. And when an artist signs to a major label, it's safe to say that their death is in many ways factored into the initial investment. And in many ways, after an artist has peaked in popularity, there becomes an awkward point in their career where the artist is worth more to them dead than alive. Due to the business that he did, yeah, they were, they, and I can't even say mad. Is that they didn't have a part of it? Let's be real. I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say it out there straight for everybody listening. My uncle didn't die; he was murdered. I feel the same thing about Prince. We are losing a lot of stars because you have to remember these are basically insurance policies. When he dies. Whatever was owned by the company reverts back. We're not talking about $100,000. We're not talking about a million dollars. We're talking about billions of dollars. Notice that when my uncle dies, why do you hear all his music? Why is there a Motown cartoon out now? Okay, well, obviously when my uncle was alive, he wasn't giving the rights to anybody. But when he dies, all of a sudden... Now, what does that have to do with Bobby Fuller? And why are all these musicians dying in their prime? You know, like the music industry, you're a musician, I'm a musician. The music industry is so corrupt and so mob-like that it's hard for, for independent artists to get to the mainstream. But when they get to the mainstream, it's like they die. It's like they, they live a certain amount of years and then they just drop off the edge. What, what are your thoughts on that? Last breakdown that explained how they're worth more dead at a certain point than they are alive really helps put into perspective uh how it's the money it's the love of the money that probably gets these people off if it's not full-on suicide i'm sure there's some cases where it's actual suicide because it's a, a you know a, a very mentally taxing thing to be put put on the public pedestal but at the same time there's probably a lot of examples where it is just the love of money and wicked gangster types taking these people out so they can keep making money off of their dead name. Well, I'm about to prove to you that exactly what you said is is the truth and why I believe that so many of these musicians are murdered. So let's go ahead and play that clip. It's pretty incredible to me that all of us have kind of heard this anecdote about musicians dying at a young age, but every time this happens, nobody casts an ounce of skepticism about this kind of thing or how much of these people are worth dead. That, in my opinion, is the true dark side of the music industry. And it seriously does not help that social media in the modern day has made artists' deaths even more lucrative. As one Nielsen executive had stated in 2016, if Earth, Wind & Fire's Maurice White passed away 10 years ago, you might have read about it in a paper and then waited until there was a store open. Now the news cycle travels extremely fast and you get more awareness. The instant gratification is there. You can buy it or stream it and it magnifies the consumption. Now, instant gratification is definitely an interesting word choice from this Nielsen executive. This was different from other years, Dave Bakula, Nielsen Senior Vice President of Industry Insights, told The Post. The news cycle is very viral, 
I've never seen a year like this before. The number of big name artists passing away. The music industry is getting an extra boost from the celebration. Notice that the author of the article here had to add this for context. While in recent history it's been labeled the Prince Effect, we have known for quite some time that an artist's passing could be lucrative. But just how lucrative it is, we are just now getting to measure the effects more closely in the modern day. One paper titled Music, Death, and Profits lays this all out for us. Notably, this was the first study of its kind to show the long-term effects of this phenomenon. In their study that monitored 81 artists who passed away from 2015 to 2017, they found something pretty disturbing. Our findings show that a rate of sales does not return to pre-death levels, but instead is in most instances persistently higher even several years after the death of shock occurs. Album sales leapt a staggering 226% on average, just on the day the artist died, and they doubled overall on average for the first 100 days. For bigger artists like Prince, the effect was even more pronounced as he saw a 16,000% increase, while other large artists saw very staggering numbers as well. There's a clause in record contracts that allows record labels to cash in even more after an artist's passing. This has been going on since the early days of the music industry, and it's quite literally a standard practice. It's called the death clause, or the non-performance clause. Essentially, it goes something like this. Company shall have the right to secure insurance equivalent to 10 times the estimated value of the artist's earnings from any source of revenue for company's sole benefit. Company shall be allowed to employ any insurance carrier or combination of the same to assure this benefit and need not consult or require signature compliance from the artist. Company shall keep such information confidential, except that the company may disclose information to the applicable insurance carriers or as required by law. Artist or artist's estate shall have no right to review or claim the benefit of any such policy obtained by the company. In short, here is what a death clause does. If an artist fails to perform or pay back advances, the artist becomes more profitable dead. Today, the hit clause still exists, but it is more subtle, and whereas it used to be worth thousands, it's now potentially worth billions. Labels invest millions in new talent, and the insurance policy is a protection against loss or a way of collecting projected profits for music, t-shirts, books, foreign rights, and everything else in all forms. Now that you're aware of what a death clause is, I think it's important that I give you a textbook example of this so you can see how this usually plays out. For now, I'd like to draw your attention to the story of Bobby Fuller. After Fuller moved to LA in 1964, he was signed to a record label by the name of Delphi Records, owned by producer Bob Keen. Keen was also the band's manager, and given the fact that it was called the Bobby Fuller 4, Bobby was the front man. Shortly after the band had scored several hits, like their cover of I Fought the Law, on July 18, 1966, Bobby's success in the music industry would be cut short. After receiving a mysterious phone call in the early hours of the morning, Bobby was believed to have left his Los Angeles apartment at 3 a.m. Before Bobby left, his road manager had been half asleep watching TV in the living room. He vaguely remembered that Bobby might have been going to see a girl named Melody that night. After heading out from the apartment, he took his mother's Oldsmobile, and he would set off into the night. As the day turned to morning, Bobby failed to meet up with the other members of his band for rehearsal later that day. Around 5 p.m., a couple other visiting musicians had come to see Bobby at his apartment. They claimed that when they were driving up, Bobby's mother's car was not there. Bobby's mother, Lorraine, also noted this. She had been keeping an eye out all day for Bobby to come home. After the two visitors came into Bobby's apartment, Bobby's mom then went to go get the mail. To her surprise, the car was there. Upon closer inspection, she found Bobby lifeless inside of the car. He was found lying across the seat, where the entire car reeked of the smell of gasoline. There was a 2.5 gallon gas can found below the driver's seat, and a gas hose was also found nearby. Upon discovering Bobby in this state, Lorraine called the police. And when they arrived, they took a quick look at the body, and they ruled that Bobby had taken his own life from drinking gasoline. And the authorities quickly discarded the gas can and called it a day. The car was never dusted for prints, the police didn't interview anybody, and all in all, it was an open and shut case. Later, it would be revealed through the autopsy that there was no gasoline found in Bobby's stomach where the coroner later stated that Bobby had died due to inhalation of gasoline fumes, classifying Bobby's death instead as an accident, a finding that nobody, not least his own mother and family, agreed. Multiple witnesses noted that it appeared that Bobby had been beaten up badly and had a broken finger. There was blood found on his shirt and face. Multiple witnesses, including Lorraine, also made the comment that it looked like he had been dragged on the ground, and his body showed various scrapes and injuries. 
The coroner claims that they were mistaken. He claimed he found no bruises, no broken bones, and no cuts, or evidence of a beating. Instead stating, Body in full rigor, skin slip due to high temperature in car. Considering that the car hadn't been in the lot for more than 15 minutes, this quite literally made it impossible that he could have driven up on his own. According to an article from Spin Magazine, in 1983, Rick Stone reported that he was sure Bobby's head had been doused with gasoline. To this day, Jim Reese maintains that he saw a half-burned book of matches and a burn on the vinyl of the backseat of the car. Assuming the car failed to light, this meant that the persons responsible were lurking nearby. Rather interesting when you factor in that Bob Keen had just so happened to magically appear at the scene within moments. Now, Bobby's story is essentially a cautionary tale of what can happen in the music industry. Bobby had become worth more dead than alive behind the scenes. He had a life insurance policy taken out on him for about $850,000, while all of the other members of the band had policies at around $100,000 each. In the days before his death, the band was on the verge of breaking up. One member was getting ready to return to his family after touring. Another member was likely to have been drafted into Vietnam. Infighting was rampant, leading to Bobby replacing one of the members, and the two musicians from earlier were new potential replacements for his current band. Bobby Fuller had had enough of his management. Between them failing to fulfill orders for his recent single, and the fact that Bob Keen had been micromanaging their sound, often making artistic decisions, which led to their worst financial failure, the Magic Touch. Which in spite of heavy promotion through Payola, it still was not a commercial success. Now, what are your thoughts on that, Jake? That kind of tied it all together? Yeah, it did. It really did. It really kind of puts in perspective that the contracts we sign uh, are oftentimes contracts with death, if you think about it. It's like a, like a leprechaun saying, here, sell me your firstborn child, and I'll <laughs> give you this pretty piece of gold. You yep. know, and, and as long as you give your rights away to these companies, they are evil they, and they, they own you and it makes me wow yeah i was gonna say it's what it's what happened to elvis it's what seemed to have happened to jimmy it's what happened to kurt uh like all of these guys they they had a lot of money to be made off of them and uh and they were starting to get in the way whether they were having attitude issues they ha you know were uh participating in and this or that that wasn't as productive as maybe these companies wanted them to be they kind of got moved out of the way and so i while i didn't know this gentleman that we're talking about today uh it's interesting that he just falls right in line with all these other conspiracies you know well he was actually one of the first ones to to die suspiciously like that like in the public like where people actually knew that hey there's some sketchy stuff going on with the with the authorities and with the you know them tampering with evidence and them just getting rid of it and not even investigating in the case when there was so much evidence that could have proven that you know it was everything but a suicide and it was everything but accidental but they refused to do that and it's just i think i think a lot of people see big musicians like that as not human almost. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like they're watching a movie, you know, they don't think of them as real human beings. So to the to the management, why should they care about them if it's all about the money? You know, it's so sick and it's dark and it's, it's gross. <laughs> a lot of them get involved with uh, kind of the darker side of society. Like they were involved with uh, the, the mobsters uh, in this guy's case. Um, I know uh, there was with any drug use, you're kind of rubbing shoulders with people that probably are just trying to make a buck off of you, especially if you're talking about a, a drug dealer that's um, giving you things that can kill you. you know? And many examples, uh, like I thought it was interesting that that one interview clip you showed, he was like, uh, they even th did this to Prince, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and to... Uh, one of those uh well-known names in motown you know and it's really just it's interesting that the official stories never seem to match up with what can be revealed just by some critical thinking mm -hmm. and i mean these are just my opinions i'm not saying this is what really happened but if you look at all the facts like like my dad always said do your do your own research you know but uh, I got one more clip for you guys, and it has nothing to do with Bobby Fuller. It has to do with one of the best comedians, my favorite comedian of all time, 
talking about his faith, he doesn't admit that he's a flat earther, but he doesn't deny it. So let's go. Now, what do you think about that? Like that is that not crazy? That's really interesting. It, it almost ties into what we were talking about earlier in the show with uh, some of the the flat Earth topic, and it, I mean, Norm Macdonald was a mm. great comedian, and it's so good that he kept hold of his faith, um, even though, like he said, it's not the most popular thing to say at the time. And uh, it's also interesting to me that he didn't outright deny, you know, the FE topic, uh, even though. Um, you, the way you can hear him breaking down that scientism question is how do we know the people that claim mm -hmm. this current theory are right when those theories of the past seem to have been refuted and changed? We could just be inheriting another version of uh, errancy, right? So it, very, very interesting clip. I really like that. Norm Macdonald is, is my favorite comedian ever, like of all time. And, and I was so sad when he past and i've probably seen every interview every clip of him uh, known to man that's available to watch but it's just cool that on stage he didn't care what anybody thought about him he didn't believe in political correctness you know he he allowed himself to have his own faith and you know just brushed everybody else off he refused to bow down to the man yeah, I, I love that, you know, anybody who's willing to stand up in the face of adversity and stay true to their beliefs, you know, some somebody with respect. Absolutely, man. Well, that's all I got for history. And uh, let's go on to some memes. Meme me up. All right, so since we're talking a little bit about, uh, our, you know, faith, and uh, here's a, a funny one. Uh, when you try to work out and remember that in heaven, we will be given new bodies. Uh, <laughs> and just lay down and go to sleep. This is <laughs> something I uh, struggle with is keeping motivated to stay active, right? You know, doing a lot of work in front of a computer. Uh, sometimes you forget that, you know, it's worth getting outside a little while. Yep. Uh, but <laughs> it's definitely sometimes looking at this meme could be one of my excuses like, oh, yeah, well, it, it'll, it'll, you know, maybe we'll come back as superheroes without having to put the work in, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, here's a funny haircut. Excessive force in the front, resisting arrest in the back. <laughs> That's great. Now, uh. Here's a picture of three types of unicorn, a, a regular unicorn, a heavy assault unicorn, and a high-speed submersible unicorn. <laughs> and uh, yeah, people, sometimes they laugh at the fact that, did you know unicorns are mentioned in the Bible? And I believe they're talking about this uh, version two, the heavy assault unicorn, uh, but it's actually uh, associated with the tribe of Ephraim. Uh, and their hmm. symbology, so uh, very interesting. Now, gas prices are too high, so I'm driving my new Toyota Co Corolla. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's a it's a Corolla. Um, Florida uh, <laughs> is America's mullet. I don't know if you knew that. Heck but, yeah, uh, make makes sense. And uh, for our last little image of the day uh, I know a lot of people uh, might be preppers uh, some people just step into it for the first time well uh, not everyone does it the same been canning <laughs> soup this week getting ready for summer follow me for more recipes uh, it's funny to me because my wife and I we, we've been doing some actual canning and uh, this looks way easier let's just put it that way <laughs> uh, but uh Awesome. All right. Well, that's all the memes I got for today, Jeremiah. All right. Awesome. Meme me up. All right, everybody. Thank you for watching episode 13. Thank you for being here. And thank you for the current news and the great memes and Opa's Corner. And we'll see you next week.
Hey, Skiba News Nation family, thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe. You can also help support this channel by getting yourself some Skiba News Nation merch. Also, we are proud to announce that we are now on Patreon, where you will get bonus content, shout outs, and much more. Thank you again for watching and helping us stay on the quest for truth. Huge shout out to all our Patreon supporters. Thank you so much for your support. We couldn't do this show without you. If you want to help support us, go to patreon.com forward slash Skiba News Nation. We are also proud to announce that Skiba News Nation podcast is now available on podcast platforms. My new book, Never Got to Say Goodbye, is now available. My book contains an up close and personal account of who my father, Rob Skiba, truly was as a father and as a man. It includes over a hundred never before seen photos of my dad and our family. A portion of the proceeds are going towards funding our search for justice for my dad, Rob Skiba. Visit skibanewsnation.com forward slash book. Again, skibanewsnation.com forward slash book. To learn more about the book, our website will show you where and how you can purchase my book. Also, you can sign up to be notified when my mom's book is ready. Her book will be a first-hand account of the 40 days of terror that my dad and our family experienced at the hands of the medical system that completely denied him of his human rights and how they denied my mom's right to be my dad's medical power of attorney. Thank you so much for your support and for helping us stay on the quest for truth and carrying on my dad's legacy.